Welcome to The Art of Modern Ops, a podcast series on modernizing cloud infrastructure. Hosted by Cornelia Davis, WeWork CTO and author of the book, Cloud Native Patterns. Hello, everyone. Today on the program, I am so honored to have Matt Klein join us. Matt Klein is a software engineer at Lyft, and you might know that name because he is the creator of Envoy. Envoy is one of only a small handful of projects that have reached the graduated setting, uh, the graduated level at the CNCF, which is really saying something. And uh, if Matt retired today, that would be enough to get him inducted into the computer science Hall of Fame. So I'm so thrilled to have you here. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you so much for having me. I don't know about the Computer Science Hall of Fame, but that's a, <laughs> that's a very nice statement. Thank you. Well, I don't know. I think that Envoy, uh, the creation of Envoy, that's a pretty big thing. So <laughs> All right, thank um, you. maybe you could add a little bit more to my brief introduction and tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and your background and what you're up to. Sure, of course. Um, I've been uh, working in systems engineering for about 20 years. So that's, uh, you know, doing things that span networking, virtualization, cloud computing, those types of things. Um, for the last 10 years or so, I've been uh, almost entirely, uh, you know, focused on the networking space. Um, I worked on Amazon's EC2 doing high performance networking. Uh, I worked at Twitter for a number of years in their edge proxy API serving system. And then, yes, for the last uh, about five years now, uh, really pretty pretty amazing that it's been almost five years uh, I've been working on Envoy at Lyft. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, so I, I would like to, you know, kind of begin our conversation around what ultimately led to the creation of Envoy. Um, the way that I understand it, and you can certainly fill in some, some background, is that in the kind of earlier days of Lyft, or at some point in Lyft's history, Lyft started to move towards a microservices architecture. And I was around during those days where people started moving to microservices. And at the time, it seemed like there were technologies and frameworks. It was trying to solve some of the problems that came with a microservices architecture were being solved with things like libraries, things like the Netflix OSS set of tools. Um, those were being built into or, or being supported by things like the Spring Framework. But as I understand it, Lyft took a different approach. Can you tell us a little bit more about what motivated this and the approach that you took? Sure, of course. Um, yeah, you know, what, what you'll mean with you know, things like the Netflix OSS and uh, Finagle from Twitter is that, you know, those are both Java libraries. And that's the, that's the real key point is that I think, you know, we've seen um, a major shift in definitely the last five years, plus 10 years, where uh, the, the age of an organization choosing a single language, and if you look back 10 years ago, it would probably be Java, um, you know, the, the, the time of an organization choosing a single language for their deployment um, is, is really past us. Uh, you know, if you look around in modern computing, it's quite common now for organizations, either because they've chosen to do it themselves or through acquisition or things like that, you know, that they now have three, four, five, six different languages, you know, that they're writing services in. Um, and, you know, in that type of situation, you know, if you want to use the library-based approach to solving some of these microservices concerns around observability and networking and things like that, you really have a choice. You can either implement that library over and over again in each language, and that's a very costly investment, or you can look at a different way of doing it. And that different way is the direction that we went with Envoy, which is the sidecar proxy approach. And when I joined Lyft five years ago, um, you know, we had a monolith in PHP. We had uh, already started to write services in Python. It was becoming clear that some of our higher performance services would be moving towards Go. So, you know, even at that very early stage, we, we had three languages. And now, you know, fast forward today, we have, we have thankfully gotten rid of PHP. Um, but, you know, we have Python and uh, Java and Go and Node.js and, uh, you know, C++. Plus, plus, there's just so many different different languages that people are using. So I think 
when I was looking at developing Envoy, I wanted to take a lot of the learnings from libraries like Finagle and, and things like the, like uh, Netflix OSS projects, but wanted to actually, um, you know, do that in a way where we could actually, you know, build that once and not have to re-implement that in every single language that we wanted to use. So that's, you know, that's essentially how it started. Uh, interesting. Very interesting. Um, now, it's interesting that you should mention the different libraries and the different languages because there is another open source project that is also quite popular that isn't totally tangential to what we're talking about here with Envoy as a proxy, and that's open telemetry. And they, they've they continued down the road of having the different language bindings. Um, any comments on that? Because observability is certainly part of what you're tackling with Envoy. And we'll get into yeah. the details more in just a moment. Sure. Well, you know, there, there are things that you can do in a sidecar proxy or an out-of-process approach, but there are things that you just can't. So when it comes to in- instrumenting actual application code or something like open telemetry, it, it's not possible for something like Envoy to understand what the application is doing. So, you know, it's not that we're going to be able to completely relegate all types of infrastructure to the sidecar. There's always going to be, you know, libraries and, and code that runs within the application. So open telemetry is an example of something where there's going to be a component of it that, that, you know, probably always needs to live within the application. At the same time, open telemetry is also supported within Envoy. So that means that, you know, we can get a, you know, base level of observability through things like tracing and logging, you know, through Envoy and through the service mesh or the API gateway. Um, But the application owner can use a similar library and a similar interface within their application. So, I think that's a key point is is that there are a lot of benefits and there's of course some downsides too of moving logic into, you know, the, the sidecar architecture. Um, But it's not like we can completely take things out of the application entirely. Oh, that distinction is really, really helpful. Now I'm curious, I mean, Envoy has been around long enough now that everybody kind of grocks and gets this sidecar proxy thing. But when you first floated that idea of sticking a proxy in front of every single service, a, you know, fully distributed proxy, lots and lots of instances of this proxy all over the place, were there people that looked like, looked at you like you were nuts? There, there are certainly people that looked at me like I was nuts, but you know, one historical point is that that's actually not the first thing that we did. Um, we uh, we actually deployed Envoy first at Lyft as an API gateway. Um, so you know, we built a lot of credibility within the organization through deploying Envoy as an edge server, um, meaning we were able to show a lot of the benefits about enhanced observability, uh, enhanced logging, like better performance, those types of things. So the organization had already started to see the benefit of, you know, of what a piece of software like that could actually provide. Um, And then it wasn't like we just said, oh, we're going to deploy it in front of every service. Um, You know, I'm a very pragmatic engineer. I like to do things incrementally. So it was actually a very incremental approach to doing that deployment. We were able, you know, to first get Envoy in front of our monolith. And then we had the edge proxy talk to the monolith. So, you know, we had a very limited quote service mesh at that point. And then again, people started to see the benefits. We started to be able to generate these amazing dashboards of, you know, the networking traffic between these two services. And then it was a very organic thing. Service owners said, wow, I I would like that type of functionality in my service. Um, So, you know, we were able to get things deployed fairly heavily um, just by people seeing the benefits um, until we eventually said, well, you know, this is clearly beneficial. So let's actually do the full mesh approach. Oh, interesting. That is such a great exemplar of how you mix practicality and innovation together. Um, I love that. I, that yeah. wasn't yeah, it's um, you know that's that, that that is always the thing that I recommend most to people when they're starting projects. You know, even if the even if the vision is bold, it's it's very important to have a plan that allows you to deliver it. You know, slowly, right? Or not slowly, but at least 
incrementally. Yeah. And I think it's important to prove value in an incremental sense. Uh, and then, you know, I, I think you can always um, move towards your vision, move towards your North Star, if you will. But uh, it's important to do that in small chunks. Yeah. I love that. Um, so we've been talking a little bit about, we haven't touched, gone deep into the technology, but we've been talking about Envoy as, as the proxy. But Envoy plays a role in a, 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 perhaps in some ways you can think of a bigger thing, which is the service mesh. And so for some of our listeners that maybe have been hearing about Envoy and proxy and service mesh, but really haven't had a chance to dig in, can you give us kind of quick high level of Envoy, what service mesh is, what, on, what the role is that Envoy plays in the service mesh? Sure, of course. Um, so at its core, uh, Envoy is a network proxy. So, it, you know, it itself is not a service mesh. Um, you know, today we see Envoy used as a network proxy in a large variety of different deployments. We see it used in, you know, edge slash API gateway deployments. <clears throat> we see it used in um, service mesh or client side networking deployments. We see it used as like a middle proxy load balancing tier within architectures and, and, and in some organizations, we see it deployed in all of those cases. So Envoy is really, it's a, it's a tool, it's a highly extensible tool um, that, you know, does network proxy, it does, um, you know, it, it, it does enhance observability, um, and it has a lot of powerful configuration capabilities. Um, but it, it's really, it's a building block tool that allows it to be used in a variety of different scenarios. From the service mesh perspective, I think service mesh is obviously these days a very large buzzword. Um, you know, I've got lots of opinions about it, but um, at least from the buzzword perspective, service mesh really just means that you are relegating a bunch of your functionality, um, you know, to a separate piece of code. And one of the things that I like to make clear to people is that um, I think a lot of people associate service mesh these days with the sidecar proxy pattern. So use, using something like Envoy, using something like Linkerd. But the honest reality is that, you know, if you use a library like Finagle or use a library like Hystrix or use a library like gRPC and you link things together and do client-side load balancing, you, you pretty much have a service mesh. So to me, you know, service mesh is really just a, a concept where um, you are effectively doing client-side load balancing. You know, you're integrating with the central service discovery system. You're trying to do this so that you can, you know, increase microservice performance, you know, get better observability, more features. Um, but I, I don't know that service mesh is necessarily specific to the sidecar proxy approach. It's really just, it's a, it's a paradigm by which we are trying to solve, um, you know, a bunch of the underlying problems in microservices, which many of those problems tend to devolve down to uh, networking and observability. Uh, to paraphrase what you had just said, was that Envoy is, as you said, this building block, and you described, if you will, a bunch of different deployment topologies of that building block. And I personally have some experience um, in the past where I have spent some time at Pivotal, um, and at Pivotal, we used Envoy, Envoy for example, to, to implement a, if you will, more of a centralized routing um, engine. So it wasn't yep. distributed as a mesh. It was distributed yep. as a node, if you will. Yep. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, now, one of the things that I'd like to kind of po pull on that thread a little bit is, so I get it. The service mesh is a whole bunch of different services that if you are, if you will, are distributed and then form kind of this mesh of distributed services across the board. And it needn't necessarily be as a sidecar proxy. Now you've also used the term networking several times. And when you introduced yourself, you talked about your background in networking. Is Envoy really focused on networking or does it address some of the other things like service discovery, which I guess if you squint, you might say, well, that's networking too. But are there things that people wouldn't necessarily think of classically as networking that Envoy does or intentionally does not address? 
Um, you, you know, that's a, that's a, actually a pretty complicated topic just because we, we have built Envoy at this point to be a very extensible system, meaning it's extensible through its configuration model. It's extensible through the code that can be loaded into it. You know, now there's people working on WebAssembly, which will make it even more easily extensible. And um, the the reason that I'm bringing that up is that people are using Envoy in absolutely incredible ways that I n- never would have thought of, you know, and I think that's what happens when you, when you build a platform, you know, you build a, a popular platform and people end up using it in these really amazing ways. Um, so it, it's hard for me to actually comment on specifically, you know, what does Envoy do or not do just because people are using it in really incredible ways. What I can comment on is what Envoy does at, at its core, meaning the the core system. And uh, the core system of Envoy really is about networking. Um, I guess it's it's about, you know, allowing data to um, you know efficiently flow through the system and handle common concepts that, that come up around integrating with various service discovery types doing dynamic configuration observability etc um, so you know does envoy itself seek to become a service discovery platform like would it become something like console or something like etcd or kubernetes no i mean that's that's not a project goal so i think our high level project goal is to um you know i guess the simplest way of saying it i don't know that i've ever quite said it this way before is that you know we're trying to simplify you know moving bytes around the microservice architecture. Um, so again, at its core, that's around networking, but it's around all of the things that come out of that, you know, dealing with different protocols, dealing with um, getting data in and data out from an observability perspective, logging, right? Like, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think there are core pieces of functionality that Envoy has been designed to focus on. Um, and then, you know, the extensibility system and the dynamic configuration system has made it such that Envoy is being used to do all, all types of things and is being used as a building block in, in a, and a ton of different systems, you know, and that's obviously super awesome. Yeah, and the fact that so many use cases are being um, implemented using Envoy and Envoy is being extended to it uh, to address these use cases really is kind of proof positive that you did indeed build a platform, not a solution, not a single yeah, solution. Yeah, I've been, you know, when I talk about it now, I, I, I like to think of it as a network operating system. You know, it's a, it's a platform that people are using to build higher layer systems. And, and this ends up coming up uh, just in a sense that, um, you know, Envoy has become very trendy, it's become popular and, you know, it gets, it gets written about and spoken about. And I think at times we have users come to our website and, and look at our API and some users get quite confused because it's a, it's a system that has an absolute ton of different configuration. And, uh, I think what's what's interesting is, is that you know we we live in this world of layered systems, and I, I think it's really impossible to build a system that can satisfy every type of customer. You know, there's low level building blocks, there's higher layer things that you know that are uh, a bit more opinionated, but hopefully have less configuration. And I think Envoy is a pretty low-level building block. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's a project goal to necessarily have a super simple configuration. Obviously, we, we try to make it as simple as we can within reason. Um, but, but Envoy's goal really is as a building block that allows it to be used in, in a whole ton of different things. And like you said, I mean, the way that it's been adopted in such a short period of time by all of the different cloud providers and open source projects and, and user companies and vertical products, it's its really astounding. Yeah. So can you say a little bit more about that that embrace? Um, maybe, maybe tell us about a use case or two that really blew your mind that you just thought, wow, okay, this is, this is really taking it to the new level, whether it be you know, somebody in the vendor community or a user, um, anything that you want to tell us about from that perspective? Oh, wow. You know, there's just, there's, there's so much. I mean, it, it, it would be hard for me to, to actually pick 
any any particular cases. Um, I, I think for me, I'm just continuously blown away um, by the just just the breadth of different use cases, right? I mean, we see people in the financial industry using it and, and people are using it for different reasons. They're using it either for security features or performance or things like that. Um, you know, we see cloud vendors that are building entire products around it. Um, you know, we see people that are now using Envoy in, you know, platforms as a service and functions as a service systems as a building block. Um, like there's people now that are using Envoy and like serving games and I, it's just there's there's so much um, that it would I would be hard pressed to actually pick any any particular case. Yeah. Okay. But now you mentioned FAS, so you mentioned functions as a service, and yep. functions as a service is is different. It's similar to PaaS in that it's, you know, you can say that it's somewhat serverless. So you're providing an abstraction that where the developers don't have to worry about the, the applications. Uh, I'm sorry, worry about, worry about the infrastructure and those types of things. But functions, the fact that these things are coming and going, maybe even more um, often, and there's even more of kind of constant churn in the function space. How do you proxy something that is like there one second and gone the next second. Yeah. The, the best way of thinking about it is that I, you know, I think functional systems, they're, they're like microservice systems on steroids, meaning you have all the same problems. They just happen more and they happen faster. So if you look at a, you know, a, a like container orchestration system, like Kubernetes, you already have a pretty high rate of change. You have, you know, containers coming and going and, you know, from batch jobs or just for scaling or things like that. And you just take that rate of change and you, you make it an order of magnitude more because these functions are coming and going. Um, but at the end of the day, though, it really is from a system perspective, it's all the same type of problems. You're still doing auto scaling. You're still doing service discovery. You're still doing routing. You're still doing observability. Um, so I, I think, you know, Envoy has become very popular for, you know, probably a few different reasons. Um, but but one of the main reasons that Envoy has become very popular is because of its API. Um, we call it the XDS API. It's a, it's a suite of APIs um, that allow control planes to configure Envoy dynamically to do certain things. And um, I think that dynamic configuration mechanism has made Envoy very amenable for building these types of highly dynamic systems. People can build control planes that work with Kubernetes, you know, they, they work with, um, you know, potentially, uh, you know, higher rate of change functional systems. Um, and people have built extensions into Envoy where, you know, from a, from a functional perspective, Envoy will, for example, hold a request. It'll communicate with a backend control plane to make sure that, you know, there is a, um, a running instance of that function available. And then when that's available, you know, Envoy will basically release that request and then it will go to the function implementation and then, and then bring the result back. And, um, you know, there's there's all of that backend functionality that to the end users seems like magic, but still it, it's built on the fundamentals. You know, it's built on auto scaling, it's built on dynamic configuration, it's built on routing and things like that. So um, I, I, I think functional platforms are going to continue to get more and more popular. I'm, I'm a big believer that in the five to 10 year time frame, you know, I think most people will be building their applications on these types of functional platforms. Um, but, you know, the, the, the building blocks are very similar and the engineering challenges uh, to, to do that at scale and to do that at high performance are quite large. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that focus around the dynamicism. And so let me actually turn to another area where there's a great deal of dynamicism. Um, as of late, people are really starting to understand, first of all, that CICD is not one word, it's two words. There's yep, CI sure. and then there's CD. And one of the 
ways that that is is starting to kind of have some more awareness in the industry is around progressive delivery. So this idea that when you are deploying a new version of something, a new version of a microservices, you don't do like we did in the old school where we upgrade every every single thing. We might do it side by side and then flip a switch and we go from version one to version two all in one big shot, yep. but that we actually do that progressively. And it sure seems like um, that is a, a place where the sidecar proxy and Envoy and certainly networking, networking certainly plays prominent, prominently because we're doing traffic routing. You had talked earlier about moving bytes around this microservice architecture. So that's squarely in that space. Anything that you want to tell us about the role that Envoy plays in that use case? Yeah, I think there's probably two major concepts here. There's obviously progressive deployment. So these are things like blue-green deployment, things like that. And I I think that, again, coming back to what we were just talking about, about Envoy's API, um, Envoy is very amenable to building these types of progressive deployment systems. So that's that's part one. So, you know, I, I think you are seeing people figure out that, um, you know, it is easier to implement dynamic routing and, um, you know, percentage-based rollout and things like that on top of Envoy than some, some of the other proxies that it has tended to re- replace recently. Um, the other concept here that's key is also feature flagging. So, you know, I think people in the industry are realizing that it's not just about progressive deployment. It's all it's also about feature gating so that people can deploy, they can, you know, hold features behind individual percentage-based rollout gates. Um, and Envoy also has built-in functionality to do that where it can, for example, on a per route basis, you know, it can do percentage-based rollout or even internally Envoy has a fairly rich feature flagging system that we use to protect individual risky features. Um, so I, I, I think that Envoy plays a part in both of these concepts. Okay, interesting. Now, you might know that we here at Weaveworks have an open source project that we've been working on that my colleague Stefan Prodon has been working on called Flagger. Um, I don't know whether you are familiar with Flagger or have done anything with Envoy and Flagger or know of anybody who's done that. Um, I am definitely familiar. I have not personally used it, um, you know, at, at Lyft, just because we developed Envoy over the last five years, we have a lot of internal tools in this space. So when it comes to incremental deployment or feature flagging or things like that, you know, we basically have internal tools that do all of those same things. But I think that, you know, a lot of the work that's being done uh, around SMI and Flagger and just generally trying to bring these concepts to the average microservice developer is super awesome. Great. Thank you. All right. So as we kind of start to wind things down here, what's next? What's next for Envoy? Is there a particular area where you're looking to evolve? Is it tangential? Is it evolving Envoy itself? Anything that you're excited about in that space? Sure. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a couple of high level things. Um, I, I think one of the major efforts that we have a team working on right now, which I'm very excited about is what we're calling Envoy Mobile. So that's running Envoy on Android and iOS. Um, the idea there being that, you know, we really have all of the same networking concerns on our phones as we do on our backend systems. And that, um, you know, with these highly connected apps that we're building now, the phone or the end user really has to be considered to be part of the overall system. Um, we're actually very close to rolling that out to our production app at, at Lyft. So I'm very excited about the progress that the, that the team is making there. Um, on the Envoy project side, I think there's a, there's a couple of different things that are happening. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think we're actually focusing a lot just on project scaling. I mean, it, you know, the, the rate of contributors and project growth and, and, and stuff that we have now continues to really blow my mind. Um, and that means, you know, that we have to keep doing things around 
release management and security and like all of those things that no one likes to think about, but they're, but they're super important. Um, so, you know, I, I think just a continued focus on making sure that we can scale the project is obviously super important. Um, on a feature perspective, we have a bunch of people working on quick. Um, so that will hopefully be productionized soon. I think that's very exciting. Um, WebAssembly is a very big effort that's going on right now. I, I think WebAssembly is probably the, the future of Envoy extensibility, just because it'll be a stable um, a stable API that people can use to actually write extensions and not have to compile them into the Envoy tree. So that's that is super super exciting. Um, and then you know beyond those two big ticket items, there's oh, there's just always so much going on. Um, I, you know, I think what, one of the things that I say about Envoy is that it's it's a little different than most other open source projects that tend to be driven by companies in the sense that Envoy is a, is, is really a community driven project. And by that, I mean that, you know, the features and things that get implemented are really driven by, by the people and the companies that are actually using it. Um, so I think a lot of times people ask me for a roadmap, but you know, I, I, I can't, I can't really pull up, pull a detailed roadmap out um, just because it's hard to know exactly what people are going to work on. Um, but those are, those are some of the big ticket items that I'm excited about. Yeah. So Lyft is not a, uh, a cloud native platform vendor. You are a mobility company. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, that's the difference. So. Well, yeah. Right. And, you know, I mean, Lyft now employs only a fraction of the people that actually work on Envoy. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's like a ton. I think Google's probably the biggest contributor now, but um, even beyond Google, I mean, there's just people at so many, so many companies. I mean, we, we, we do a release every, <laughs> every three months or so. And, you know, we, we regularly now have hundred or 150 contributors per release. So, um, you know, there's just lots of people. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's just been so fantastic to watch kind of the trajectory of Envoy and to hear from you, not only about the successes that have been to date, but how this is really just the beginning. Um, there's still so much innovation happening in this space and so much value that uh, is still untapped that people are going to get from this technology. So thank you for creating that. <laughs> thank you so much for saying that. Thank you. Um, so Matt, it has been such a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you for the, your historical perspective, your insights. And once again, thank you for creating Envoy. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening to The Art of Modern Ops with Cornelia Davis. Watch for further episode announcements on the Weaveworks blog or follow us on Twitter at Weaveworks.